I'll get started. So uh, we're really lucky to have Victor Sai here for our department colloquium. Uh, Victor is a professor of geophysics at Brown University, and he moved to Boston just last year from Caltech, where he was a professor in their seismo lab. Um, and then before Caltech, he was a Mendenhall postdoc with USGS's Geologic Hazard Science Center. And he did his PhD at Harvard, which he finished in 2009. Uh, Victor started his academic journey as an undergrad at Caltech. And looking through his papers and his website last night, um, I, I came away with this impression that Victor is a very naturally curious person. <laughs> He's worked on all kinds of different things. Uh, so um, glaciers, tsunamis, planetary formation, and even volcanology. Um, and some of his earliest papers were on stuff like star patterns in lake ice and uh, theoretical constraints on the origins of true polar wonder. Uh, so really, he's covered a lot of ground, but perhaps the most efficient way to describe his work is non-traditional seismology. So I think Victor specializes in finding seismicity in all kinds of unlikely places. Um, so perhaps water flowing through glaciers, um, during sediment transport in rivers and in debris flows. Um, and today Victor is gonna be talking about some of his recent work in understanding high frequency earthquake ground motion. So thanks very much Victor for joining us. Thanks, Megan, for that really nice introduction. And it's been really great to talk to people uh, the whole day today. Um, it's been nice to talk to people in a place that I can't visit personally, but uh, to, to see people over Zoom. Um, so that's been really nice. So again, um, yeah, as Megan mentioned, I do have a lot of different interests, uh, but today I'll talk about earthquakes and specifically trying to understand high frequency ground motion. This is the ground motion that tends to cause a lot of damage. So uh, this picture here that you see on this title slide is damage from a recent earthquake. Um, as we were discussing earlier, I believe it's the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake um, that uh, this picture of damage is from. So I'm gonna be talking um, a lot about uh, these uh, ground motion issues uh, where I've shown just an example of what ground motion might look like in the time domain. Um, and we'll also be showing I'll, I'll be showing some uh, frequency domain um, pictures like the spectrum, so where we look at energy as a function of frequency. And I should mention that this is collaboration that I've actually been doing with Greg Hirth. So it's I've been fortunate enough to um, already have started a collaboration with some of the people at Brown, even though I've been at Brown now uh, only for a year. Um, and so this is uh, yeah, this is work in collaboration with him. And, and finally, I wanted to mention that if you guys have questions throughout the talk, um, I'm very happy to take questions um, during the talk as well as afterwards. So feel free to just interrupt me. Um, I'm not sure I can see any of the chat or, or, or those functions, but if you can just yell out, uh, that's fine. Okay, great. So, so what am I gonna be talking about? So first of all, ooh, how do I go? Let me go, there we go. Um, so first, let me give an outline of what I'm going to be talking about. So I'll, I'll first uh, describe how we think or the traditional models for what we think causes high frequency ground motion. Um, I'm going to try to spend actually quite a bit of time discussing some of the challenges that I see with the standard frictional models of explaining this ground motion. Uh, and then I'll talk about the, the work that I've done recently. So considering this other types of physics uh, specifically this elastic collision model and, and uh, our hypothesis that maybe it's this type of model that might produce some of these strong ground motions um, as well. So, uh, so that's what I'll talk about. And um, I wanted to start out with a historical perspective. So it turns out that you know before about 1910, we didn't really have a good understanding of what causes earthquakes in the first place. And after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, um, there was a study done by Reed in 1910 that really put forward the idea that actually earthquakes are happening because there's fault slip on faults. And that may seem like a natural explanation, but people didn't really understand that before 1910. 
And I wanted to highlight this one sentence in his paper that's highlighted here in red, uh, which is saying that uh, with the exception of the straightness of the lines, um, this picture on the right, um, that last experiment reproduces exactly the characteristics of movement which took place at the time of the California earthquake, the 1906 earthquake. Um, and so that's the first time when people had the idea that actually it's because stress was relieved on faults that these earthquakes happen and the ground motion from, from these earthquakes is caused by um, the, the waves that propagate out uh, from, from that, from that uh, fault slip happening. So that's this sort of general concept that we've had for about 100 years, actually not such a long time. Um, but this picture has slowly changed with time. So we've gotten a, a more nuanced point of view for what causes earthquake ground motion. And in the, uh, say, 60s and 70s, uh, people started to understand that it wasn't just the fault slip that causes ground motions, but it's the abruptness of fault slip. So it's the abruptness of the initiation of fault slip. It's also the abruptness potentially of the ending of fault slip that causes uh, most of the ground motions that we feel. And so there are a number of models that were produced in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the Haskell model is one of these very commonly uh, cited models about how how we think earthquakes um, occur. And there's also the, the Brune model. Um, so, and, and generally people talk about these two models together as the Brune-Haskell model or the Haskell-Brune model, where there's some initiation phase of the, uh, when, when slip is happening. So you might have a rupture like this, uh, that's rupturing, the earthquake is rupturing from the left to the right of this figure. And at each point along the fault, you have um, an initiation of motion, you have motion continuing, and then you have the stopping of that motion. Um, and then at this time, people realize that this is actually what's causing the ground motion. So now let's fast forward to, let's say the, the 90s, when people realized, well, actually earthquakes are not such simple rectangular features uh, that where you have very smooth fault slip occurring along this rectangular feature. Actually, there's a lot of heterogeneity in that fault slip. So you have different amounts of slip happening in different places, um, but basically it's still the same idea that there is friction um, that prevents motion from occurring and then there's failure of that. So there's the stress changing along the earthquake um, and the frictionally governed stress changes um, happening over a heterogeneous fault that is producing these uh, ground motions. Um, and there are a number of papers that I could have talked about here. Uh, this is just one example of one of these heterogeneous models. So this model here is showing differences in amounts of fault slip across, um, across one of these models that people have made for, for these earthquakes. Um, and it turns out that the heterogeneity of the fault slip is actually quite important for uh, trying to produce the amounts of ground motions uh, that, that we observe uh, uh, during real earthquakes. Okay, so that's what it was in the 90s. And then now let me go to the present. So in the present, um, this is the state of the art of what people think about in terms of uh, what causes, uh, and, and actually I'm gonna focus on the high frequency part of the ground motion. So what causes high frequency earthquake ground motion? And the, uh, the little bit more nuanced point of view is that we think that it's, the standard point of view is that it's due to heterogeneous friction on, uh, that's mediating fault slip. And the faults may not be these perfectly planar structures anymore. You may have rough faults um, along which the rupture is happening. And you can also have heterogeneous structure. So as you have waves that are produced from the fault slip, you can then, those waves propagate through a structure which may not be homogeneous. And um, due to that heterogeneity in both the, the, the roughness of the fault, also the slip on the fault, and then also the propagation of the waves away from the fault, that, that all contributes to governing the ground motions that we observe. So this is what I would say is the sort of standard picture for um, what we think um, is going on. And I just wanted to highlight this one uh, paper by Eric Dunham uh, from 2011 that shows these really nice simulations of, of this process of heterogeneous friction on these fault surfaces, rough fault surfaces, um, where you can see instead of a, a very clean S wave, instead you have a, a very um, heterogeneous sort of S wave with all these bumps and wiggles um, as the S wave is coming out 
Um, and um, it's no longer this, this very, very um, pretty simple, simple picture that we thought of before. So that's the sort of background of, um, of the talk. And the, this comes up to the question that I started asking um, and, and what I'm gonna talk about for the main part of this talk, which is, does this model work? And, and what do I mean by that? Um, does the model, does this traditional model explain the high frequency ground motions from earthquakes? Um, or is it possible that there's other physics that is not involved with the, the statement that I um, wrote up here with the standard answer? Is there other physics um, other than frictionally mediated, mediated slip um, that might also cause significant high frequency ground motion? So this is what I'll talk about today. Um, for those of you that are interested in more information about this, um, I've actually already written this paper um, with Greg Hirth um, that's been published earlier this year, so just a couple of months ago. Um, so if you're interested in, in more details about what I'm gonna tell you about, I, I suggest you can take a look at the paper afterwards. <clears throat> okay, so that's the major question I'm gonna be asking. Um, but before I get into the, the modeling work that I've done, um, I wanted to explain a little bit more about what these standard models predict and why some of the predictions of those models we think might not be very good. Um, and so to start off with, um, I'm gonna show one of, one of these plots again of energy as a function of frequency. Um, and this is a standard uh, uh, sort of prediction for what an earthquake uh, signal would look like. If you look at the energy at different frequencies, uh, this Bruin Haskell type model, and actually all of the different types of models that I mentioned earlier in terms of these frictionally mediated models um, would imply that that the uh, would imply that the frequency dependence of these observations looks a certain way, where um, there's this low frequency asymptote over here where you achieve a sort of constant value. And then there's a high frequency asymptote on the other side where you have energy decreasing um, with increasing frequency. Um, and this sort of uh, uh, result is, is uh, often described by what's called a corner frequency. So if you think about where this asymptote, this uh, low frequency asymptote meets the high frequency asymptote, there's what's called a corner frequency in between. Um, and one thing that I just wanted to stress here was that um, if you take the physics of this, these types of models, then there is a specific prediction for how that corner frequency, which I've called F sub C here, is related to other physical parameters of the earthquake, with the most important one potentially being this parameter, which is uh, delta uh, sigma, which is called the stress drop, which has to do with how much did the stress change uh, during the earthquake, meaning how much stress was relieved um, from before the earthquake to after the earthquake. Um, and and if, you, if you believe these, these models, then the corner frequency should be related to the stress drop in a very particular way. I'm not gonna go into the details of exactly why it has this um, format, um, but that's basically what the prediction is. Um, and this assumption has been made in many, many different papers. Um, and it, it's actually a very successful prediction in the sense that this sort of model that predicts this omega squared decay um, has been observed basically everywhere. So one of the, one of the really nice things about this, uh, this basic framework that I've talked about so far is it makes a prediction of this omega squared um, type of decay. Um, and it has a very specific reason for that corner frequency, which is related to the, the stress drop. So um, as we'll see later, um, there, there's a question about <laughs> whether this is the right model um, and whether the corner frequency should be interpreted in this way. Okay, so that's one of the predictions of the um, model. Now let me talk about some of the possible challenges with using the traditional model. So one of the main challenges is that with all of our increases in ability to make predictions for these very complicated sorts of uh, fault geometries and also including the heterogeneity of, um, of the subsurface. It's still the case that these state-of-the-art simulations 
Um, and um, this one in particular, for example, I'm, I'm um, again referring to this work by Eric Dunham, where he did these really nice simulations that tries to reproduce all the, all the physics that we think we, um, we understand. It's these state-of-the-art simulations don't appear to reproduce certain observations. Um, and I'm going to focus on one of them, which is uh, this, uh, this amount of energy as a function of frequency uh, for what we think is realistic. So it turns out that people have made measurements of the, of the roughness of faults. Um, and people have been doing this for many decades. But the number that they sort of get out in the end is that the amplitude of the roughness compared to the uh, wavelength of the roughness is typically in this range of 10 to the minus 3. So for example, if you had a fault that was 1 meter long, um, you would expect there to be um, about 1 millimeter of, of uh, non-planarity to it. Um, or if you had a fault that was one kilometer long, then you would expect there to be approximately one meter of non-planarity um, to that fault. And so that's been observed in lots of different places at lots of different scales. Um, and if you put those into the simulations, um, you get this red curve. So this red curve is the one uh, that's labeled 10 to the minus 3. Um, alpha is 10 to the minus 3. And you get these predictions for how the amplitude of the earthquake depends on frequency. And you can simply compare this with what we observe. I'm not going to show um, all the observations, but hopefully you can trust me on this, that the, the high frequency observations from earthquakes typically looks like a flat line when, when plotted in this space. And that's true of almost any earthquake that you could look at. Um, as long as attenuation is not um, an important factor, then it looks like this straight line where uh, we would expect there to be equal amounts of this acceleration spectrum um, at very high frequencies as, as well as at very low frequencies. And that if you put in this realistic sort of roughness in the models, in these frictional models, you cannot achieve uh, a match with those, with, those, um, with those high frequency observations. So there's a potential problem. That, that's one issue. Um, now let me go on to some other ones. Um, Another thing that we've looked at for a long time is the, sh is the focal mechanisms or what people sometimes call beach balls. Uh, so if you think about an earthquake and how it radiates that energy to different directions, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the typical shape of this radiation pattern where it has these four directions where there's large amplitudes and then there's these nodal directions, these four directions in which the amplitudes are typically very small. Um, and so this is a typical pattern that people expect of earthquakes. And in fact, one of the successes of all these frictional models is that uh, it works really well at very low frequencies. So this is an example of fitting data, which are plotted in these um, sort of uh, gray circles here, and comparing it with a model of, of this sort of four-lobed radiation pattern at relatively low frequencies. So this is a frequency of 0.5 Hertz. So relatively low, under one second um, frequency, or sorry, under one Hertz frequency, um, more than one second periods. Um, and as you can see in this plot, the prediction does reasonably well. So you can see, you can see the four lobe radiation pattern in the data and the model predicts exactly this four lobe radiation pattern. And that's one of the really nice things about the model. But we can contrast this with what it looks like at high frequency. So I'm going to switch back and forth between the low frequency picture and the high frequency picture. But at high frequencies, uh, the data look like this. So now, now you see these, these dots are scattered all over the place. Um, the predictions are still that you would have this four, nice four lobed radiation pattern. Um, and it looks like the observations don't look like that. So the, the black line is an average through through the, um, through the dots, the, the data points. Um, and you can still see a little bit of a hint of, the, of that four lobe radiation pattern, but it's much more isotropic, meaning much more even in all the different directions uh, compared to what the predictions would say. And this is at a, at a frequency of five Hertz. So we've gone up an order of magnitude in frequency. So it's 10 times higher frequency than we were looking at in the previous one. And so just to flip back, um, here's the one, the data for the low frequency observations 
or the predictions match the observations relatively well. And then here's the one for high frequencies where this four lobed radiation pattern that you still expect uh, from the frictional models um, don't appear to be uh, well matched at these high frequencies. And people have talked about this for a long time. So this specific paper by Tak Takemura is from more than 10 years ago now. Um, but he talks about how even if you try to include the heterogeneity of the structure um, that causes, that potentially causes it to be the, the um, causes the wave field to be more isotropic than you would otherwise predict, you either can fit the high frequency data or you can fit the low frequency data and you cannot, apparently you cannot fit both of them together. If you, if you make the, if you put enough heterogeneity so that you make the high frequencies isotropic, then it turns out that you also make the low frequencies quite isotropic, which is not what we observe. And so it seems like there's this problem um, with these standard models here. Any questions before I move on? I don't, I hope there's people out there listening. Was there, okay. Well, I'll, I'll just continue unless I hear, uh, unless I hear someone shout out at me. Okay, so that's another thing that, that we think is, um, is different. Um, so potentially these, uh, potentially these. Sorry, uh, the Fed has a question. We sure, just yeah, have, go have ahead. To unmute him. How do we do this? Oh, I can see the chat actually. Hey, um, oh, hi. Victor. yeah, maybe we can write questions in the chat. My question of, is about this statement by Takemura. Um, and I would think that this really depends on the spectrum of the wavelengths of the heterogeneity that you put in. So if you put in heterogeneity that's very small scale, but not large scale, I guess you probably could match it with structural heterogeneity. Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know exactly the degree to which he tested this, but I believe he tried uh, small scale features as well and found that even for the small scale feature, even if you have like point scatters, which are in infinitely small, uh, then those point scatters also scatter the, the low frequency waves. And so you have a problem fitting the, the low frequency data as well. It's a, it's a good point though. I, I should uh, follow up on that to check what, what Takamura actually did. Thanks. Okay, um, maybe I'll go on. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or um, just, uh, I guess you can't unmute yourself. So yeah, maybe you have to put it in the chat. Okay, how do I go back to this? All right, so here's another interesting set of observations uh, that I'll discuss a little bit. Um, I'll try to go through this quickly, but the basic idea is that we have lots of observations interpreted with uh, those frictional models that I told you before, where you can then solve for what's the inferred stress drop. So that's what's plotted on the vertical axis. And you can plot that as a function of the size of the earthquake or the moment, which is plotted on the horizontal axis here. And one of the interesting findings is that um, despite um, globally, we would have typically constant stress drop, meaning all over the world, approximately earthquakes seem to uh, have the same amounts of stress changes during the earthquake. Um, there's these certain families of events where if you look at um, just a small little region, like for example, what I've labeled here is the green dots, these green uh, Chi-Chi repeaters here. These are all from near the 1999 Chi-Chi earthquake. Um, these seem to follow a different scaling where it, it, appears, if, uh, it, it appears like the stress drop changes by multiple orders of magnitude um, over this very small um, region. At least that's the interpretation from, um, from these standard uh, stress drop types of arguments. And so you have at least a factor of a thousand um, change in stress drop um, uh, with the standard interpretation. And it turns out that this is very hard to explain within standard frictional models um, I'm not going to go through the details here, but there's lots of frictional models that try to reproduce these very large differences in stress drop between events um, over the same region, where basically um, they try to have the same area rupturing in a fault, but with three or four orders of magnitude differences in amount of slip 
Um, and it appears like that is difficult to achieve in these frictional simulations. I'll just leave it at that. The last piece of evidence that I wanted to um, provide here as one of the challenges with the standard model is really sort of a question. Um, and there's these two sorts of questions you can ask, which is on the one hand, why is it that some of the most, the shallowest earthquakes that we observe appear to have relatively high stress drops? Um, or another way of putting it is that they appear to have lots of high frequency energy um, in them. And this, this sounds like um, an apparent contradiction to what a lot of people think about because typically people think about stress increasing with depth. So at the surface, you might think that there's not very much stress that could be relieved. And so you might expect the stress drops to be lower. Um, so there's a question about, well, why is it that we observe very, very shallow high stress drop events um, where um, there's high frequencies produced. So that's one question. Um, and then on the other side, uh, there's the question about intraplate events. So there's places where earthquakes tend to happen a lot. And then there's other places like um, say the New Madrid area or Charleston, South Carolina, or actually I heard you guys had a, a Delaware earthquake um, relatively recently. And um, there's a question of well, why does it appear like th those events that happen in, in intraplate settings, they, um, they often seem to have higher than average stress drops when measured um, seismologically, meaning they have very high frequencies um, associated with it and also more damage sometimes uh, from these events, uh, despite the fact that uh, we think the, the stresses in the system should be similar. So um, if you think about what are the stresses within the crust of the earth um, in California versus in Charleston, South Carolina or Delaware, we, we think, and actually people have tried to measure this and have found that the amount of stress measured within the crust seems to be similar both in these intraplate and the, in these interplate regions. And so if the stresses are similar, why are the stress drops different? Um, and so it's really a question about that. Okay, so now I've provided, you know, a lot of uh, um, observations um, that um, some of them seem to be a little bit challenging to explain with the standard model. And I'm finally gonna get to what, what we looked at. <laughs> so this is, brings us to the question of, is it possible that there's additional physics that we should be accounting for other than friction um, in a, in a rough fault zone and, and heterogeneous structure. And, and one of the key things that I'm gonna focus this talk on is the idea of fault zones being somewhat complex. So we know from, from geologic observations that fault zones are not simple planar structures. They're not even simple uh, si single rough structures. There are very complicated sort of structure when you see them in the field. Um, and I have one picture here from this paper by Mark Swanson, um, but there's many examples of this where if you go to a fault in the field, um, and you might note that this, the scale bar here is, uh, there's this five meter scale, scale bar for this uh, plot, you can see lots of complexity. So there's multiple fault strands, there's multiple cross-cutting relationships between, between these fault strands. Um, and in general, it doesn't look a, a whole lot like that nice, simple planar, single planar structure, or even a rough, uh, a rough single structure. There's multiple structures, um, and you might imagine that uh, these complex fault zones might have interesting other pieces of physics other than just friction um, on, on the fault surface. So, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today and try to evaluate this um, specific hypothesis of what is the role of if, these, if this fault tries to slip, meaning you, you try to have an earthquake on this fault, then what additional physics might you want to include here? And I'm gonna focus on one specific piece of physics, which I think is important, and I'll try to explain why I think this is important. But one of the things that we think has to happen is that in order to accommodate this large scale slip, um, some of these pieces within the fault zone are going to hit each other. Um, and so in addition to friction, 
you might need to consider the collisions that occur between these structures within a more complicated fault zone. And so I'm gonna to try to evaluate here this idea that elastic collisions, and potentially they're not elastic, but we're gonna start with the um, simpler assumption of elastic collisions of these structures within the fault zone that might be on this sort of meter scale or maybe tens of meter scale, maybe even hundreds of meter scale, um, where these objects need to collide with each other in order for large scale slip to occur. And I wanted to have, um, I wanted to mention two things here um, about reasons that we think that maybe this, these processes are occurring. Um, first of all, we've actually observed fault zone dilation or, or at least um, suggestions of fault zone dilation um, have been observed in multiple places. So Rick Simpson has, has made a bunch of geologic observations where it appears like um, there's been um, some increase in volume and then decrease in volume of certain parts of fault zones in the past. Um, and we also think that the, the frictional contact that we think is typically there is sometimes lost during fault slip. So there's many different reasons this might be. And the, the, here there's just a couple of different possibilities for why that friction can drop dramatically. But if the friction drops to close to zero, then you would expect there to be some amount of sliding of objects past each other where then they could re-collide with each other. And so that's the thing that I'm gonna be talking about today. And the specific question is, what does this physics predict and then do these predictions help us explain some of the observations? Okay, um, again, feel free to put in comments into the chat if you have any questions and then we, um, someone can unmute you, but otherwise I'll continue here. And I'll talk about the very specific prediction that this, this elastic collision model has. So if you think about these, uh, this sort of structure, so this complicated fault zone structure and having slip. Um, I like to think in terms of idealized models. So I, I've idealized that situation to where instead of thinking about these more complicated structures, you might be able to think about these as sort of particles that still have to um, uh, collide with each other as the fault zone is slipping. And so the idealization here is that we think of these structures as particles that you can then try to calculate um, what happens when these particles hit each other or, or when these structures hit each other. So you might think about it in this case where you have all of these structures which have to collide with other, par other structures and also the, the sides of the fault zone. And you can make a very simple prediction. Um, here is a prediction that's been made for a long time. So this goes back to Hertz. Uh, it's the same Hertz that, uh, that we use for the unit of frequency. Um, he, he wrote a paper in 1881 that showed that if you just drop a ball um, on a surface, um, or if you just have contact of a ball with a, a surface, there's a certain amount of force um, that is um, related to that contact. And if you drop the ball, the forcing time series looks a lot like the one that I've drawn here, where it's like a half a sinusoid. And there's a certain contact time that's predictable from elasticity so he, he made these calculations based on a perfectly elastic material, and that those are the calculations that I'll follow. But you can actually solve for what is this time scale of the contacts depending on the various things. So maybe depending on the height of the ball that you drop or the elasticity of the ball um, or, um, or the radius of the ball. And um, I'm again, not gonna get into the details here, but it turns out the contact time depends on many parameters that you might think are relevant. So it depends on the radius of the ball that you drop. Uh, it depends on the speed of, of, the, of the contact, or for example, you could think about it depending on the height that you drop the ball. Um, it also depends on the, the densities. Um, and then there's this other factor that relates to the geometry of these objects that I, I won't really talk about in this presentation. Um, and then in the bottom is the elastic modulus. So it depends on all these things that we think it should depend on. Um, and you can make a very specific prediction. Um, now it turns out, if you just translate this force as a function of time and think about what kinds of ground motions you would expect from this forcing time series, turns out we can make a, another prediction, which is it looks just like these omega squared models that I was telling you about earlier, if you look at it in the frequency domain. So 
Um, there's a lot of math that goes into that, but um, I'm not gonna go through that math, but basically the prediction is that you have a low frequency asymptote at low frequencies, uh, it's constant. And then you have this high frequency asymptote for um, at higher frequencies, you expect the energy to decay with frequency. Um, and it turns out that it has exactly the same form as this omega squared model that I talked about before. So already, I think it's kind of interesting that with a different kind of physical model, so now you're talking about impacts, you're not talking about friction, you're not talking about uh, the fault, um, didn't really need to um, uh, lose any stress across it. As long as you have these particles that are impacting something else, which presum presumably is due to the fault motion, but um, if you have that, then you would predict this type of um, decay of the energy. It turns out that we can also make other predictions. So um, in order to make these other predictions, you have to assume something about the distribution of particles or the distribution of structures that you have within the fault zone. But if you assume that it's somewhat stochastic, meaning that there's lots of structures within the fault zone and it's complicated and they're, um, they're impacting in all sorts of different directions, then it turns out we can make predictions for the amplitudes um, and also the radiation patterns um, for this type of um, uh, summation of a bunch of impacts. And, and then we can compare this with observations that we have. So that's what I'm gonna do in the next couple slides. Um, and I'll tell you how, how this different sort of model makes predictions that might be more consistent with these observations that I showed you before. So let's go back to this one that I talked about earlier with the scaling of stress drop uh, um, that's maybe not predicted or, or maybe hard to understand within the traditional model, um, why you would have this very large uh, difference in the amounts of stress drop for these different events that are happening in the same place. Now, it turns out if you, if you take this impact model, um, what does the impact model depend on? It, you might have remembered, um, I'm not going to go back to it, but in the equation that I wrote, stress drop doesn't play any role at all in determining anything that comes out of this model. And one of the key things that we can look at is that uh, contact time, um, or in other words, the corner frequency that is determined by that contact time. And it turns out that corner frequency is determined by different physical parameters compared to in the frictional case. So instead of the corner frequency being de uh, dependent on stress drop, like I showed you from the standard frictional model, the corner frequency depends on these other things that relate to the contact uh, between these particles. So it depends on the size of the things that are contacting each other. And then it also depends on things like the elastic modulus um, of, the, of the particles or of the substrate. And so the prediction of this contact model or of this impact model is that we predict that at a given fault zone, with a given roughness and a given size of particles uh, or given size of structures within that fault zone, we would expect it to have constant corner frequencies or in other words, constant uh, contact times. If you then translate that uh, into what you would have inferred um, if, uh, if you made this uh, sort of stress drop type argument, you would predict exactly things that fall along these lines. So I've drawn this one line at um, R equals two meters. If you have a fault zone that has structures of the size of two meters, then you make a prediction that things should fall along this line. And if you have a fault zone that has larger sized um, structures, 15 meters, you would predict there to be um, the earthquakes along that fault would, would line up along this line. So the, the different interpretation with this sort of physical model is that you would predict all of these events that lie along the same line as sharing the same sort of um, size of structures and that all of these different earthquakes with different, um, uh, that don't fall on the same line would be because those different fault zones have different sized structures. So it'd be a very different reason um, that uh, these earthquakes would have uh, the variation of uh, apparent stress drop um, in, this, in this plot. Okay. Let's go back to the radiation patterns. So um, again, those beach ball type um, mechanisms. 
and thinking about what does the impact model predict at high frequencies. It turns out that the impact model predicts that um, at any frequency at which the impact model is dominant, uh, then we would predict there to be uh, a lot closer to an isotropic uh, distribution of ground motions compared to uh, the uh, compared to the the fault friction case. And one thing that I didn't quite mention earlier, but turns out to be true in these models, is that if you try to compare the amplitude predicted from these impact models and the amplitude predicted from the frictional models, at low frequency, it turns out that the friction model always wins, uh, meaning that the low frequencies, even if you add this impact model to the frictional model, so you, you think about them happening together, then the frictional model always is producing more low frequency energy than the impact model. But it turns out that depending on the, uh, the amount of, of roughness or the amount of these particles that are impacting uh, compared to the amount of heterogeneity in, in friction, then the impact model can dominate at high frequencies. So this could potentially be a reason why at high frequencies, we see the dominance of these isotropic patterns, meaning that the impact model might dominate at these higher frequencies, whereas at lower frequencies, it's these frictional models uh, that we think um, dominate the, the ground motions. So um, I think I'll leave it at this for, for this um, particular prediction, um, and then move on to the, the last set of things that I had mentioned earlier about, well, this question about why do shallow events appear to have high stress drops? And why do intraplate events appear to have, uh, sorry, intraplate events appear to have high stress drops, even though um, we expect these shallow uh, stresses to be small and we, dis we expect the intraplate settings to also have similar amounts of stress build up as in these uh, intraplate settings. And the, the prediction of the impact model is that it predicts that rougher faults, faults where the aspect ratio of the um, structures within the fault zones are different, uh, would have higher corner frequencies. And then we would predict that those are the ones that would appear to have higher stress drops. But really, the, the reason that they would have these high frequency ground motions would be because of impacts and not because of actual differences in stress drop. And so, Actually, I think it makes a lot of sense that, um, especially for the for these shallow events, um, sorry, for these shallow events here, where you may not be building up that much stress, but we do believe that shallow faults might be rougher, um, or at least as rough as the faults at, at at larger depths, and so that might be a reason why we have these events that are that appear to have high corner frequencies and that are interpreted to have high stress drops um, where um, maybe the stress drops are actually not that high. And then similarly for the intra, intraplate earthquakes, we think the, the prediction of the impact model would be that these regions would have higher corner frequencies because the structures are rougher. And so that we think also makes sense because um, in intraplate settings, you may not have had enough time for these faults to develop really nice, planar, uh, smooth features. And you might have these um, uh, rougher uh, features uh, where you have complex faults um, that would have these, uh, these rougher features that would then predict higher stress drops. Okay, so um, I'm actually getting near the end here. So I just wanted to say um, a couple other things about what this would imply in terms of um, if this model uh, were correct, then what would it mean for interpretations that people have made in the past? Um, so it turns out that lots of these seismological inferences of stress drop are actually these measurements of corner frequency, which are interpreted in terms of stress drop. Um, and if this alternative type of hypothesis is correct, then it would turn out that these measurements 
made in this way would not necessarily be related to the true stress drop, meaning the amount of stress that changed in the earthquake, but it may be much more related to fault roughness. I mean, I, and I think that's a very exciting prospect in terms of it might mean that many of these observations that people have made before, and I've listed a whole bunch of people who have made these types of measurements, it's possible that all of these measurements are telling us something about fault zone structure uh, rather than something that they initially thought um, these, these observations were telling us about, uh, that it was related to, to actual amounts of stress drop. Um, and these things are things that can be tested um, and um, things that I'm, I'm actually quite interested in, in trying to test in the future. So let me close with the, this last slide about predicting earthquake damage. So um, I, I tried to motivate in the beginning that you might care about these high frequency ground motions as opposed to the low frequency ground motions, um, because it turns out that it's mostly these high frequency ground motions that are damaging for the typical types of structures that people live in. So for these relatively short uh, buildings, say shorter than two or three stories, uh, most of the ground motions that cause uh, lots of damage to these buildings are the very high frequency ground motions. Um, and so of course we'd like to know what causes, what fundamentally causes these high frequency ground motions and are certain faults more dangerous uh, because they often produce more high frequency ground motions compared to other faults. And um, this is one place where I think if, if this model is right, then it would predict there to be different reasons why different faults might be more dangerous or less dangerous than other faults. And so specifically the impact model predicts that these damaging high frequency ground motions are mostly a consequence of fault zone structure, meaning the shape and the roughness and the size of these structures within a fault zone um, and may not be so much related to how much stress built up uh, at, that, at that time. Of course, the amount of stress that builds up will affect how the, 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 lar the long period, say low frequency ground motions um, that you would have in large earthquakes, but these high frequency ground motions may be more affected um, by the fault zone structure. And that has you know, significant implications for how you would want to uh, think about damage prediction, um, about these ground motion prediction equations that people uh, think about and how certain faults might be might cause more of those ground motions than, than typical. All right, so um, that's basically all that I wanted to share with you guys today. Um, hopefully sh showed you that, you know, there's these frictional models that we've been using for a long time, and we do think that they do many things quite well, but potentially some of the high frequency observations that we have are a little bit inconsistent um, with these observations and that there are potentially alternative models that can explain these. Um, so we think specifically this impact model might be uh, a good hypothesis. And I would say at this point, it's still a hypothesis. So it's, I haven't proven anything so far. Um, and it's still something that we'd like to test uh, going forward and trying to test the different predictions of these two different models. Um, but it would have a very different implication for um, predicting both the seismological data and for predicting damage. So again, I, I refer you to this paper if you want to read more about it. And thanks so much for inviting me here uh, to give this talk. Thank you, Victor. <laughs> I'm sorry we can't have broader applause <laughs> on Zoom. Um, OK, we've got some questions coming up. So I saw Wendu's hand first and then Mong Khan. And then, oh, Sarah's clapping. Okay, Wen Lu, Mong Han, Laurent. Let's start with Wen Lu. Hi, Victor. Um, this Hi. is great. Thank you for the very or original and the start to productive talk. Um, let's say I am one thing that big takeaway from your talk I got is a uh, uh, seismologist that got the um, stress drop wrong. Right, so you can't really get the stress drop from corner frequency. As an experimentalist, obviously one of the things that's uh, puzzled us for the longest time is uh, we can have really high stress drop in laboratory earthquakes, whereas uh, seismologists always tell us the majority of them will be one to 10 MPA, that's it. 
so now if corner frequency is not a good uh, um, parameter to infer the stress drop, what can we do in measuring stress drop when you don't have the luxury as we do to measure stress drop as a, in the lab? Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. Um, and first of all, I do agree that um, the implication of the talk is that if these corner frequencies are mostly set by impacts instead of friction, uh, then you should have this alternative point of view. Um, I'll just bring up this one figure, which I didn't talk about that much. Um, but so this, uh, let's see. Oh, actually, <laughs> this is the wrong figure. It's OK. It, it turns out you can add the predictions from the frictional model um, to the prediction from the impact model. And what it ends up showing is that actually there is still an intermediate frequency band that could tell you information about the stress drop. But you can't just use the simple uh, corner frequency criteria in terms of measuring the stress drop. So, so, so it's a little bit subtle, but I would say this, the seismological observation still could tell you about stress drop. You would just have to interpret it a little bit more subtly um, and think about how the, the highest frequencies that you observe may not be related to the stress drop. Okay, so then in that uh, sense, is it a potentially you can see higher stress drop? Do we open that uh, window or door? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, potentially you could you could observe. Um, you mean both for for the uh, well, the actual earthquakes. Actual earthquakes. Not, I may right. I may see a uh, fifty MPA stress drop more frequently than right. I do now. Yeah. So it could be. Um, it yeah. I would say that yes. <laughs> awesome. Bottom line, yeah. Bottom line is yes. Some of the stress drops may be higher than pre previous estimates of the pre stress drop. That's good. It's always good to prove the seismologists that can be wrong. <laughs> okay, thanks, Wendy. So next up is Meng Han. Um, hey, Victor, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I have so many questions that I think I should also just talk with you sometime offline. But I'd be happy I guess to I have two main questions. So the first, you mentioned the photon dilation. So I was wondering how your model fits into that. The second question is about Chi Chi. So you show that in your prediction, actually it's right here. So, so that is when your radi the photon width is two meter and then you can reproduce the, you can predict that observation. But you know, as PDCP project, they drill through the fault at one kilometer depth. And the fault zone is essentially less than like three centimeter or 10 centimeter. Yeah. So how do, like, how do they be compatible? So that's a really good question in terms of what does this size that we're talking about actually mean? So right. uh, here, for example, <laughs> I've, I've said this implies that it's two meters. What does it mean that the fault zone is two meters? I think it's, it's not talking about what people call the principal slip surface. And the principal slip surface, if that were two meters wide, that would be very much inconsistent with observations. But right. there's a much larger zone around, um, you know, at what was it, 1111? Yeah, 1111. One, <laughs> uh, that people uh, got to the Chi Chi Fault. There's, there's other things that you saw at 1110 and 1113. Uh, that could still mm -hmm. be sort of part of the fault zone, even though you don't think about it as the principal slip surface. And it's really this size that, that we're talking about. It's not the, it's not the size of the principal slip surface. Mm -hmm. And then to go back to your other question. Dilation. Dilation, right. So there, there's ge mostly geologic observations that dilation has happened, meaning that, uh, that some fault zone has opened up a little bit and then closed down in the past. And I'm, I'm not an expert on these observations, but uh, geologists have made these types of observations for many different types right. of fault zones. And so yeah. I think there is good evidence that there is right. dilation. There's a recent paper actually just published two weeks ago. They found, they have solid evidence of dilation from Ridgecrest earthquake. 
Oh, right. I guess my question, yes, um, by bon, Bill Bonhart. But I guess my question is how your model can explain this. Or... Yeah, so, so maybe it's not really an explanation, but mm -hmm. if you have dilation and then you, um, the fault comes back together, that means you should have impact events happening. Ah, oh, I see. And so that, that's the sort of consistency. Uh, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's, a, a, it's not a prediction, but it's consistency with, with that sort of I see, thanks. Sure. Okay, thanks, Monghan. I forgot to mention that these two have a paper out this week, I think, Victor and Monghan. Um, I think that was a month ago now. A month ago, oh, sorry. You've all read it then. So, <laughs> okay, next up is Laurent. Hey, Victor. Um, it's a really great and thought-provoking talk. I'm really happy to come third here because when Lou asked my questions about uh, stress drop and Monghan asked my questions about fault roughness, so I get only <laughs> one left. <laughs> okay, um, I, I didn't catch, of course, all the details of the equations you showed, but I was wondering, physically, shouldn't I expect some dependence of this process on the velocity of the fault motions? I would imagine that if you have some asperities and they're hitting each other, the faster you go, the more you're going to have those asperities that may change something about the frequency. Yep, yep. And so I'm wondering if um, um, all of the events you showed there were like standard earthquakes and you expect a similar effect on a more like slow sleep event or something like this. Could that be yeah. related to tremors? I don't know. So that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I'll just come back to this slide where I showed the prediction of the uh, contact time or also the corner frequency. There is a velocity in here. So v, VZ um, is the impact speed. Um, and we think that the impact speed actually uh, scales with the slip speeds. So the reason that we don't think we see a large variation um, due to this is that we think that the slip speeds in most earthquakes are meter per second, uh, meaning they're, they're not, there's not that large of a variation in slip speeds, especially compared with the size of the structures that might be very, very different across different earthquakes. But it's true, as you mentioned, slow earthquakes, um, the, the velocity of impact would be extremely small and you would predict the, the frequencies then to be um, um, much, much lower. And you um, have a whole kind of thought, yeah, go ahead. yeah, I haven't thought too much about slow earthquakes, but it would be very interesting to try to think about whether this model has implications for and slower. Then, yeah, because you have like a whole spectrum with like low, yeah. uh, low frequency events, we have, uh, et cetera. So yeah, there could be yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. So, where, where the slip speeds are very different. Thank you. Thanks, Laurent. Next is Bed. Hey, Victor, great talk um, and really cool idea. Uh, it's rare that we get kind of new ideas in, uh, something so fundamental. So that's very exciting. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, I guess it was, you know, it's thought provocative. So I'm not even sure exactly how to uh, phrase my question, but um, we often talk about, you know, when we teach our students, we talk about constancy of stress drop with magnitude and, um, and usually, yeah, so in that plot. So I was, a, I was kind of shocked by the Chi Chi repeaters. Um, that you show and, and, and by the strong kind of trends there. But I understand that, you know, this is an inferred quantity and I was never comfortable with inferring stress drop from corner frequency because it seems like such a un, 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 uh, certain thing to do. It, it but, make assumptions. Yes, a lot of assumptions. But be that as it may, does your model predict the, something about the general relationship. So here you show what the relationship is for particular R values, but what yeah. should be the general relationship between moment and stress drop? Yeah, so I, did, I didn't talk about this in the talk, but actually if you look at these lines here, there's these two sort of closer to horizontal lines. Mm -hmm. um, the prediction of, of the impact model is that it depends the, on the distribution of sizes as a function of fault length sizes. Okay. So, so if it's self-similar, uh, meaning that the size of these structures scales exactly with the length of the structures that they're on, then you would predict a flat line, uh, meaning you would, predict, uh -huh. you would predict the stress drop to be independent of magnitude. So actually that's an interesting conclusion as well. Yeah, and that sounds important. 
Yeah, and then if if it's not self-similar, so you can make this prediction for if uh, the Hurst exponent, um, if you know what that is, is equal to 0 0.95. Mm -hmm. And um, if it's equal to 0 0.95, then you would predict this very slight increase in in um, in apparent stress drop with, with magnitude. Which is what's observed, I guess. Right, yeah, that's where I got the number 0 0.95. If you try to fit the, the observations sort of generally, mm -hmm. Um, on, on, on the global scale, then you, you typically get something a little bit um, less than one. For the so in other words, there's slightly less roughness on smaller faults, relatively speaking? There's slightly, I believe it's slightly more. Okay. Um, I mean, I would expect it to be more. I'm just... Uh, because you're inferring a greater stress drop. I guess I have to think about it because this is the apparent stress drop that yeah, you would get. Yeah. So I really should up. make this plot in corner frequency yes. space rather than apparent stress drop moment space. Um, yeah, so I would need to think about that. But it's, I, I think it's actually this, uh, a number less than one implies uh, smaller faults have slightly higher roughness. Good, and that would make more sense, I guess, geologically if you think yeah. about it, right? Yeah. Um, I do have another quick question, and I don't even know how to formulate this question, but what about super shear rupture? <laughs> Does this matter at all when you get to these anomalous ruptures? So kind of the other end of the spectrum from what Laurent was asking? I believe you can still make a prediction. Um, so, so you can still say with this fault zone structure and with this model, you can make a prediction for if those, um, if those speeds rupture speeds are higher than normal, um, you can make a prediction for that. And I think for this impact model, you would predict something similar. Okay. But it's true that the stress drops that you infer from, um, from the typical frictional paradigm is, um, is different. So, so maybe you would predict something different in that sense. Because I know that, you know, super shear is often related to kind of changes in the Kind of passing one of these weird uh, kinks in the fault, right? Yeah, exactly. Which is when, when, and yeah, yeah. Anyway, cool. Very cool talk. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Fed. So next up is Karen. Um, is that me or K Karen Pearson? I think Karen Pearson. That was Karen Pearson. Did you have a question, Karen? Nope. Not, oh, I not, do, yeah. No. You do? Oh, okay. So I'll put you after Tucker. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, so part of my questions have been uh, uh, asked and answered, but um, one thing I kind of was wondering, by weird coincidence, I guess, uh, earlier this week, I had come across a paper by Gail Atkinson, an opinion um entitled don't call it stress drop mm, yes um, yeah nice you know this and it's relatively old in an academic sense and yet people have still been using this brune model for the last 20 years on the corner frequencies so and do you know since i wasn't i guess around in the field then and I guess you weren't either, but you know, do, you, do you know anything more about that? Yeah, so actually this is a really good question about um, historically, why, why are people, some people, um, especially in the engineering seismology community, so earthquake engineers um, have noticed for a very long time that the amount of high frequency energy in earthquakes doesn't appear to be very well characterized by the thing that people call, or, or the thing that people try to measure as stress drop. And so that's the reason that Gail Atkinson wrote this paper, um, which basically says, you know, this thing that relates to high frequency energy may not have anything to do with uh, the thing that people are calling stress drop, meaning the physical parameter related to how much stress change. And um, I would say just, I completely agree with that sentiment that, that it, it may be related to these other types of physics. Um, in Gale's paper, and actually in the earthquake engineering literature in general, people haven't proposed different physics 
for what causes these high frequencies. And I think that's maybe part of the reason that people haven't really um, caught on or haven't, um, haven't tried to go away from that nomenclature because right. there hasn't been a proposed alternative uh, to what you should what you should call it instead. Right. So right. I'm proposing an alternative. Excellent. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Next up is Tucker. Hi, Victor. Uh, could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so first off, um, the details of high frequency generation processes that you described today would be observed only in the near field data. Yeah. You, uh, you won't be able to see that in a far field um, observations, correct? Right. Um, now, uh, um, in your model, um, does your model have a dominant um, size of R? or you have a distribution of Rs? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So first of all, the answer to your first question is, is yes. We only think that because of attenuation, if you're too far away, it's very difficult to see any of this stuff uh, related to corner frequency. And, and all you see is the attenuation due to structure. Um, to answer your second question, uh, we do think that there's a distribution of structures within a fault zone. So, so in fact, uh, you know, it, it, we don't know a whole lot about that distribution of structures, but for exhumed faults, we can measure the distribution of sizes um, of, um, for example, of the roughness that you observe. Um, and people have made some of these types of measurements where you can see for a certain scale of roughness, how often do you see that versus smaller scales of roughness. Um, and um, it's difficult to make these measurements in, in the interior of the Earth, of course, but we do think that there's a distribution. So what, what I talked about here is a simplified version where there's only this one size, but in reality, we think that there's a distribution of sizes. And actually, in, in the um, supplement of the paper, we talk a little bit about if you had this distribution of sizes, how would that predict something right. different? So I guess uh, in your prediction, based on your model, what you predict is the corner frequency based on the, uh, the length scale R. But then what does the, uh, but you also had uh, distribution of fall off rate that uh, what, what sort of physics um, is reflected on that, uh, the fall off rate? Yeah, the fall off rate with frequency? Yeah, um, no. Uh, yeah. In your calculation of uh, um, the frequency versus uh, energy, uh, like like this plot here, can you see the cursor? Uh, I I think uh, that was an actual simulation ne in your next slide. Yeah, there. So this one, right on the blue blue curve, uh, blue yeah. calculations, you have a, a particular fall off rate. And I'm yeah. wondering what sort of physics is reflected on that fall off rate. Ah, so actually it's what I described earlier. It's related to the contact time um, and the contact time predicts there to be a, a corner frequency that's related to the contact time. So that would be the distribution of different time scales. Yeah, exactly. So if you have a distribution of sizes, then you'd predict there to be a distribution of time scales. And so you might not predict there to be a sharp corner you would predict there to be a distribution of corners, and then you'd have to superimpose all of those corner frequencies um, and all of the different um, predictions to get uh, the final prediction. So I guess, um, suppose, um, I guess there's a distribution of uh, length scale of structures of forces, right? Um, so that, that could um, influence that rate. Sorry, that could change. So, so, so uh, the fall off rate yeah. uh, could be reflected on uh, the distribution of uh, oh, forces. Yeah. yeah, so it turns out that if you have this distribution of sizes um, and no dominant size, that you can have a fall off rate that is different than exactly the omega squared, 
but you would predict that the omega squared um, is still sort of dominant because you have all of these omega squares that are adding together. Um, and so uh, it depends a little bit on exactly how you add it uh, together, but you, um, but you can do that. Um, actually, one of the things I'll, I'll just mention briefly is that it turns out that just the size that's the most important ends up being something like the 73rd percentile size within ah. your distribution. So it's, a, it's not really the median size. Um, and that if you, if you know what that 70 something percentile uh, structure size is, then you can make a prediction using just that single number. Thank you. Sure. Okay, our last question of the day is from Karen. Yeah, I was just gonna ask about that. Um, essentially, I thought that your size distributions reminded me so much about particles in the stream and where we see like a D84 uh, as being uh, a dominant uh, size. But I wonder if your patterns also show situations where there is a dominant size and when there isn't, um, you know, the difference between the, the, the green dots and the purple dots, for example, on your, your yeah. data graph. That, that's um, actually a really good point, yeah. And, um, and I wonder if that's telling us something about the, the roughness distribution in these different scenarios and in, in these different settings. And then also think about the very large miscellaneous uh, earthquakes, which I guess you're talking about like the, the Charleston and things like that, perhaps. I don't know what they respond to. What, what is a large miscellaneous uh, earthquake that's plotted <laughs> on this graph? Oh, that, that's, a, that's a compilation that someone else made of a bunch okay. of uh, big earthquakes around the world. Okay. So um, I, I could go back to the paper and tell you what each of those events was, but I don't know. They, they look suspiciously like they have heterogeneous roughness and also a very large scale roughness that's affecting things. Is, exactly. Is that yes, yeah. exactly. That's exactly my interpretation. And I really like what you said also about whether uh, faults may have, some faults may have a narrow distribution of sizes and other faults may have a very wide distribution of sizes. Um, and that's yeah. also true of say rivers <laughs> where- Yeah, that's, uh, I work a lot on flow resistance in rivers on yeah. read, your, read your papers when we were uh, use it, using the uh, acoustic uh, methods a little bit. Oh, okay, great, great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think actually what you said is probably true for like for say these Chi Chi repeaters uh, or, or the Parkfield repeaters. Um, Maybe it's true that in these very specific places, the, the distribution of particle sizes may be narrower than usual. And that may be why there's such a nice clean um, trend here. Whereas in most places, we don't have such a nice clean trend. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you, great talk. Sure. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much, Victor, for sharing those results with us. Um, and I know we've had limited time to talk to you today because we've been online. So yeah, I encourage everyone if you have questions to reach out to Victor in the coming days and weeks. And um, and yeah, thank you very much anyway for making the best of being online. Sure, no problem. Thanks for inviting me and I'm happy to have email conversations with people afterwards. Perfect.